Two years ago, the Detroit Free Press came out, ran a full page story on my wife and I on the front page of the Sunday Travel Edition. And it gets picked up and ran in Cincinnati, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Denver Post, it gets run down in the Orlando Sentinel. And about three days later, I get an email from a man from Naples, Florida that saw the story. Says, Mr. Wilson, I'm so glad to see you and your wife are out there taking care of my great grandfather's lighthouse, Colin Graham. He said, Colin Graham and his wife Catherine immigrated from Scotland to Ontario where he's going to try homestead farming for a few years. But he didn't like that much because he was a coastal man in Scotland. So he wanted to be near the water, join the lighthouse service, went out to Charity Island as his first lightkeeper with his wife Catherine and their 12 children. He said when they got out, and she had six boys all in a row, and then she had six girls all in a row. And this is where they lived for eight years out here. He said the boys were already old enough when they arrived that on the, they were old enough that on those days when they could see ships coming into the bay off in the distance, they'd jump in the rowboat and start rowing out to the shipping channel. They wouldn't get there in time. It was just important the men on the ship to see the boys coming. And they would throw some supplies and newspapers over the side. And he writes in this email to me. He said those boys could scoop up those wet newspapers, get them back to the island where their parents would dry them out in front of the fireplace. And that's how my great grandfather got news on how the Civil War was going. Wow. Yeah. I was just amazed that I got that kind of information from that story. So uh, and then we tell a little story about William Pierce. Uh, he's going to be uh, arriving out here in May of 1885. He's 18 years old. And uh, um, I learned that when he arrived that day, he was carrying something probably every one of us would have packed. If we knew we were going to go someplace and have the kind of time on our hands that he knows he's going to have. He brings at least one thick novel out here to read to help fill the hours by, by the time. And I got to hold the book the young man brought out here in 1885, this novel. And uh, remember, he's never been here before. He's never even heard of this place. He's going to be assistant light keeper. When I saw the title of the book, it was like, is this a joke, really? The name of the book was called Mysterious Island. Mm. I wonder, did his mom, you know, see it and go, oh, this be a good gift to send my son to, you know, a new job as a light keeper out to Cherry Island. And, uh, but then when I got into it and found out that it was written by Jules Verne in 1875, now it's translated into English, it finds one of its copies, finds its way out here, and I can't read, I can't believe the content. Story about five Union soldiers captured by a Confederate army being held prisoner in a southern town. And they, uh, they're free to walk the streets during the day as prisoners of war. And they see the, the Confederate army's got one of these hot air balloons tied up in the middle of town. And one night when the wind's really blustery and it's blowing hard, these guys sneak through town, they get in a hot air balloon, they cut the lines, and as this thing goes off into the dark, wind's carrying it away, they think maybe they're freedom, but no, this is a hurricane that's starting, and they get blown 7,000 miles out over the ocean. Then they end up in the ocean fighting for their lives before they finally wash up on a small island out in the middle of nowhere. they got no idea where they're at, but amongst themselves, these five Union soldiers decide they're going to name this place after the Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. When I read that, it was like, are you kidding me? Does, this young man's got this book out here. Does he know he's on an island that was acquired by Abraham Lincoln? This seemed like quite an eerie coincidence and that I would stumble across this story. I see a few of you nodding. I'm glad to think I'm not the only one that thought that was a big deal. Well, many years later, he's a retired ship's captain. He's living over in Duluth, Minnesota with his daughter. And he's got a granddaughter. And he spends a lot of, several years with this little girl. He tells her many times that when you grow up and you get a chance, don't pass it up. Go out and see Charity Island because it's so beautiful out there. And so you can see. Uh, the tower I was responsible for so many years ago. And uh, he told her how it took him all summer to read this book. And when he finally finished reading it, that's when he opened it up that night. It's December. And he writes on the inside cover, William L. Pierce, December 4th, 1885, Charity Island. And he gave that little girl the book before he died. He said, now you keep this book. And when you get out to Charity Island someday, you take the book with you and you remember me. She had it with her five years ago when she got out here. She was 80 years old. Yeah. Almost didn't make it. I got canceled. Two full bolt loads of people. I was going to serve 96 people for dinner that night. But her husband got in my face because uh, I told him small crap warning, six foot waves. I said, we can't go. 
pokes me in the chest as I was on the I was on an aircraft. I was, on, I was in the Navy for five years. I didn't raise any sissies. And I'll bet if this was the day you were going to take your family out there, you wouldn't let those wings and waves stop you. you got to help me. She's been waiting her whole life. i got my three sons out in the van with, with their wife and nine grandchildren. And, you know, I, got, I can't take her back home with getting her out there. And I said, you know, can't we just book for another day? And he said, I just told you, I'm 85 years old. How many more chances do you think I'm going to get? I said, well, listen, you want to hang around town until 6 o'clock? If it looks like it's starting to lay down a little bit, we've got this new catamaran. It's supposed to handle rough water pretty good. Maybe I can get you out there. 6 o'clock rolls around. I don't even want to get off the couch. Um, I can see it's still blowing. I see white caps out my window out on the lake. And uh, I'm not going to go. But my wife comes around the corner, quarter after 6 in the house. She goes, what are you doing sitting on the couch? She told those people you'd meet them down there at 6. I said, look at it, it's blowing just as hard, the low, dark, fast-moving clouds, the rain coming down. I said, look, you know, we're, he, he's got to know. He's probably on, already left town, he's on his way back. But what if they're waiting down there for you? What if that was your grandmother? You can't, you got to go down there. I said, come on, honey, you go with me then. And uh, we went down there, and sure enough, she was right. I should have left her home, because I could have lied. I said, yeah, they're gone. <laughs> It was blowing so hard when I pulled up. There's Mrs. Ellison. She's got the book in her arm. She's surrounded by her whole family. They're looking out toward Charity Island. The wind's blowing so loud when I pull up in my car, they don't even know I'm there. And I roll the window down. I go, Mrs. Ellison, you don't want to go out there today. She doesn't know what I said. But she, she, now she, she knows I'm there. She goes over the window. Are you going to take us out there? <laughs> and there's rain falling on her. My windshield It's like I felt bad. And I kept the waiting. I said, you know what? We'll give it a try. And, I, and my wife, Bob, you did a double take. I said, you know what, we're going to go out here a couple of miles. So they're going to see that this is not a good idea. And I can turn around and go back and call it a day. But as I'm coming across the bay, it doesn't matter how rough it is, she's all happy and she's excited. One minute she's talking to her grandchild over here, and then she's talking to one of her sons. She's got the book out. She's giving me a heart attack because the boat's doing this, and she's trying to get over and over here. I, I, I know she's going to fall and break an arm or something. She doesn't care about how rough it is. So I keep going, I get them out here. I get them out, and I actually get them out in front of the tower. I said, listen, 20 minutes, and we gotta get out of here. It's gonna be dark soon. And uh, but on the way over, I could, you know, I was always about this tower. She was just so excited, and I could hear what she was saying about her grandfather this or that. Couldn't hear all of it, but it came through real clear that that, that man was her hero in life. And she's on a mission to honor his memory and share his memory with these kids and the grandkids. And, uh, so when I dropped them off, I said, okay, you know, 20 minutes, I'm going to make some coffee, and then we're out of here. I go up the steps, I look over, she's got the book in her arm, and she's pointing up at the tower, and they're all looking and, and listening to what she's got to say. I go in the house, I uh, look over my shoulder, I see all the white caps, low, dark, fast-moving clouds. I come back out a few minutes later, her whole family's up on the porch out of the wind and the rain. Where's Mrs. Ellison? Mr. Ellison comes around the corner and he points over by that dead tree, and there she is, she's standing out there all by herself with that book in her arms, just leaning into the wind. With the rain coming down, all these low clouds moving, white caps, it was such a sight, I'll, I'll just saw every time I look over it, I think of her. And uh, I always regret not walking out there standing next to her because it occurred to me later, she's out there remembering stories she heard as a little girl about this lighthouse on this island from the man whose job it was to keep it lit. It occurred to me later, too, you know, the only lights he would have seen from this island at night in 1885 would have been lights on wooden ships out there. And knowing that there's men out there on those ships, the pen and I, they keep lights like this one lit so they can get to where they're going safely. Um, that's a lot of responsibility, especially for a young guy like that. Must have, uh, he must have took it pretty seriously because, uh, as I thought about it later, he sure left an impression on one little girl who almost 70 years later has found her way out here to, to remember those stories and remember him. And uh, I could just hear her saying, uh, Grandpa, I got the book. I'm out here. I made it. And I brought the whole family. I can just, I can just imagine. So finally, she gets over here. I want to get out of here. Boy, I this seemed too rude not to offer. Did you want to see the house, too? And yeah, she wants <laughs> to see the house. And we all go up in the house. I get everybody down in the basement. And I got to wait a few minutes. Mrs. Ellison doesn't move real quick. And her husband's helping her up the stairs. And I point to the doors. I'm going down. We're going down. And he sees, OK. So I get down there, sons ask me how I make make our electricity out here with the batteries. And I'm explaining it to him. Then I know Mrs. Ellison made it down to the base of the stairs because we all heard what was a real emotional sob. And I stopped and everybody's quiet. We turn and look. She's at the base of the stairs. They're new stairs, but they're where the old ones always were. She's got her hand on that old limestone wall down there. And there's tears in her eyes and her hand shaking. 
everybody's quiet for a minute. Then finally she says, just seen this very wall every night he came down to get the oil. And uh, she was right. She knew that wall. She'd heard stories about his little girl. And the minute she got down there, there it was. And she's got her hand on it, remembering this guy. And it was such an emotional moment for her. And I know it affected her sons when they left because two of them walked by and they couldn't help but reach out and just touch that limestone wall on their way up the stairs. And uh, so anyway, I got him back and I got warm hugs and thank yous. And uh, I pulled her son off to the side because she had showed up with this book. And uh, I said, if you'll take that book and put it on a scanner for me and then open it up where the man finished reading the book that night and signed his name, I'd like to have those images. So that's why we got him. So we shared, we shared his story. And uh, uh, I don't realize that uh, uh, there's more of the story coming around the corner because now I'm kind of affected by the history. This one was so personal and real. Uh, you know, here was a descendant of one of the light keepers. I'm looking up uh, for some other stories similar to that one because as I'm telling this to my guests out here, they're getting, uh, yeah, I can see they enjoy it, that, that real human kind of. So I'm online that winter looking for something, and I can't believe what comes up is uh, a story on a 140-foot wooden steamboat that's gone missing in December of 1885. Uh, with 46 people on board, mm -hmm. and now 146 foot, in, and this is the ship that went missing, 100, 140 foot wind steamboat. That's from this post right here all the way over to my porch. And it's leaving Osco to Michigan, heading to Alpena. Bottom underneath uh, the lower deck is full of cows and horses, and up on the upper deck in between the lifeboats, they got crates of live chickens with tarps over them. And they take off, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon in December, so it's winter. It's almost dark, and you people are going out on a wooden boat on the Great Lakes, and there's no such thing as marine radio. There's no such thing as radios, right? And uh, but they do. They take off, and they get hit with a blinding gale snowstorm. It's so fierce uh, that before long, you said we can't see one end of the ship from the other. The, the waves are crashing into the ship as we're trying to make our way into it. Uh, they're so heavy that before long, all the bulwarks on the starboard side were stove in. I'd look that up to see what he was talking about. Those are the solid wood railings. They're being busted apart by the force of these waves. Pretty soon they've lost all the chickens, crates, and their, their lifeboats have been washed off because they're just plowing into really deep waves. Captain wants everybody on the starboard side. This guy says, oh, and by the way, so this thing goes missing. It's missing for about three days. Finally, one of the crew members gets over to the mainland, and he, he tells what happened to the ship and it ends up being published in the New York Times. I can't believe this. I got Charity Island in the headlines, uh, sub-headlines in the New York Times story. Wrecked in Saginaw Bay, Charity Island driven ashore. Uh, wrecked in Saginaw Bay, the Econo driven ashore on Charity Island with no lives lost, passengers provisioned with enough food to last until relief reaches them. This is the story. And uh, so I'm reciting this, this, this crew member saying, yeah, we took off, we hit the storm, pretty soon we got, we lost our lifeboats, the doors and hatchways on the starboard side keep getting knocked open. I come out of the engine room, I can see the first level up. All the cows and horses are broken loose. Many of them with broken legs now because they're being tossed and, and around. And uh, he doesn't want to go in there. Next level up, he sees the cook stove. Blazing fire in the galley, right, with the cook stove. The doors are doing this every time the ship rolls. And he can see the blazing fire in there. The embers are going to come out of there eventually, start the ship on fire. As he rushes in to secure the doors, he sees the colored cook on the floor with his hands pulling at his shirt. And by the time he gets over this man, he's dead. He's died of fright because the storm is so terrible. That's what the uh, crew member concludes. And uh, at some point, the captain decides uh, they're going to lose the ship. It's going to break apart. This is just, it's just, they're taking a pounding. So the only thing he can do now is turn it around, run with the wind and the waves at his back to where he sees the Tawas Point light, and then just make a hard turn to starboard. He'll be in the shelter of Saginaw Bay, or Tawas Bay. Says so finally at midnight, Captain spots the Tawas Point Lighthouse and starts making the turn. And as he starts to make the turn, he realizes that's not Tawas Point Light, that's Charity Island Light. And then boom, they crash onto that reef you guys went around coming out here today. The one with the tree growing out, the bushes. Said we hit said we hit so hard that we immediately went for life jackets, handing them out to the women with children and preparing ourselves for the icy bath. None of us were gonna survive for more than 15 minutes when we learned 
We're not taking on water with the engines off. We're wedged up here. We're holding our position. We've, we've grounded ourselves. And we just pray this thing stays put all night long. And in the morning light, they can see the light keeper and his assistant making ready with the boat. And these two guys row out there a mile offshore, back and forth all day, getting these 46 people onto this island. I think, and uh, Charlie Brown, the colored cook that died that night, they buried him out here on Charity Island. I thought, wow, this is a great story, but what am I going to do with it? How do I, uh, I've got it for almost six months, and one day I went, holy cow, wait a minute. I'm reading the story again. December 4th, 18, what was that uh, date on that? And I opened up that site cover, December 4th, 1885. This thing left on December 4th. In the morning light, we see the late keeper and his assistant making ready with, that's William Pierce. Man, I was so excited. That's the same, that's the guy, that Mrs. Ellison's grandpa, that's who it is. I was so excited, I, I was like, I, I can just, I, I know who you are. I know you finished reading Jules Verne's book last night. You woke up this morning. Lake Keeper probably woke you up and said, Bill, look at, look out here. we got a ship out here. we got to get out there and help them. And, I, I, you know, I felt like I knew this guy. I felt like I got a sunk, second uncle out of the deal. When I went to show it to my wife, I said, do you believe this? This New York Times story, that shipwreck? That's, that's Mrs. Ellison's grandfather in this story. She said, let me see that. Yep, you're right. She says, I guess it's a good thing you listened to me that day. I told you to get off the couch and go down and see if those people were waiting. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, they were all once, and I just thought, wow, what a coincidence that these, these stories would come to me like that. Um, so anyway, the other reason I want to tell you that story is that that wasn't uncommon back in those days. So there's a decision made at the turn of the century. They're going to keep a crew of men out here that will be trained, and their job will be to go out there and render assistance when these ships get in trouble. So they're going to build a two-story house, four bedrooms now, so there'll be room for these guys. And uh, they get the uh, old house off the foundation. They build a two-story house after they modify the foundation, make the walls, those basement walls higher using red brick. And they get this thing built. There's a problem, though. It's uh, The house is so tall, and they have 39-foot light towers blocking the light for ships coming around the point. So now they got to raise the tower 10 feet. But it was the federal government in charge, so I'm sure they knew that in advance that that was going to be a problem. Uh, so now they, uh, they take the cap off the tower, and they raise it 10 feet, and you go out there and look today, you'll see the first 30-some feet, it's a red brick underneath that white paint. The last 10 feet, it's a white brick. For a number of years, I thought, well, maybe a white brick, why would they Why would they switch? Was it just something that was available on sale that year? Or uh, and then I got an idea, I went to my wife, I said, hey, honey, I'll bet you I know why. I'll bet you somebody had a eureka moment and asked the question, why are we building all these tall towers out of red brick and then having to paint them white? Yeah. We'll just use a white brick. Problem solved. That's got to be the answer. And then one night, and I'm sharing this with a group of about 100 people, and a woman raised her hand. She goes, Mr. Wilson, I have a master's degree in historical building restoration. I can tell you why they use that cream colored brick. It's not really white, it's cream colored, Mr. Wilson. And uh, it was only made in Wisconsin, it was very porous, which meant it was lightweight. Mm -hmm. And that's the brick you want to use if you're not sure about the load bearing capabilities of your footings. You go with the lightest brick possible and we'll do the job. And it was a uh, Cream colored brick from Wisconsin. So now we got a 49 foot light tower, we got a two story house, and we got a group of men out here working that their whole job is just stay trained and ready to go out there when these storms drive these ships up on, on, around the island. And I'm sure they don't see the new technology right around the corner, it's going to put them all out of a job. I thought this was an amazing part of the story because, uh, you know, it turns up, up till now, up till the turn of the century, these lighthouses on the Great Lakes, they're all burning.